Hey everyone, I'm Scott Branley. And I'm Alicia Coakley. Every member of the church has a story to share, one that can instill faith, invite hope, and inspire others. On today's episode, we're going to hear how one man's willingness to show up for the Lord reignited his conversion to the gospel. Welcome to Latter day Lights. Hey, everybody. Welcome to Latter-day Lights. Alicia Coakley here. I know, and usually, I feel very weird right now. Usually, Scott is the one that does this first part of the introduction, but because Scott is going to be our guest today, he's in the hot seat. Our roles have changed a little bit, and I get to take the leads. I've already fumbled through this multiple times, and you guys aren't going to see that, though, because we're going to make it look really nice and pretty and polished and professional. But... I want to officially welcome to the show, Scott Branley. <laughs> hey. <laughs> oh, so Scott somehow managed to get away with not sharing his story for 20 some odd episodes, right? We're at like 20, yeah. almost 7, 28, 29, almost 30. Yeah. Somehow, I don't know how you did it, <laughs> but you managed to get away and now you're here, and now you get to share your story, and I'm so excited because I haven't heard it in years, and I know that you're going to add some extra things in there that I haven't heard before either. But before we get to all of that, Scott, why don't you tell our listeners about you? Okay. Um, my name is Scott Branley. Um, I'm originally from Alberta, Canada. Um, my parents moved there when they were first married, and... Uh, all the rest of my family stayed here in Utah, so we were kind of like the black sheep. And <laughs> I grew up there. I grew up in southern Alberta. And then um, when I went on my mission, um, I went to South Africa, Cape Town. And then when I came back, we moved uh, back here to Utah, and I've been here ever since. So I I became an American citizen a few years ago. and. Mm -hmm. Before that, I would always say I'm proud to be a Camerican, where in two, two <laughs> countries I'm free. So that was fun. But yeah, I'm, I'm uh, see, I've got four kids. Uh, my oldest is Clarissa. We've talked about her and she's actually been on the mm -hmm. show before. Um, she's 21. And then I've got a boy. He's, he's 19. And then a, a girl... She's six, just turned 16. And then uh, mm -hmm. a younger boy that's 13. Yep. And very cool. There are the ages of my kids are pretty close to Alicia's kids. Um, they're good friends. Alicia thinks mm -hmm. that two of our kids are going to marry each other. <laughs> so. Do I think or do I know? Have I already planned that? I'm pretty sure I planned this out. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yep. And so. now that now that she's officially 16 and my son's 16, they... I've, I've said, it's going to happen. You're going to go on a date. We're, we're going to do that. That's going to happen. I don't know when, but it's going to happen. <laughs> well, you're moving to Alaska, so that's going to make I it a little bit I am. Tricky. Yes, this is, but you know what? This is what I think. Alaska's really close to Canada, right? So like at some point in the summertime, you guys can go to Canada and visit your family and we can come down and visit you in Canada and then we can just make the date happen there. I think that'll work out great. I'm sure. It's going to work okay. out. I know. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, I've got oh, four goodness. kids. I'm married. Um, I, I'm i an entrepreneur. I run a software company and I have a plaque, a little plaque on my desk that says, leave me alone. I'm busy pretending to work. <laughs> and that's my wife thinks that's real. She yep. doesn't think I actually work, but somehow I bring home money. So I guess, I guess it all works out. It all works out. <laughs> uh, I'm an author. Um, I finished writing a book. It's called Faith to Stay. And it mm -hmm. talks about um, just some ex some of the experience I've had as a bishop um, with, with some of the members in my ward leaving the church and how that kind of spurred this um, – I don't know this adventure, the spiritual adventure of um, giving people um, compelling reasons to to stay in the church. Um, yeah. So right now I'm 
I'm looking for a publisher for that book and I expect to have that available sometime next year. So that's exciting. Yes. And let's see, I'm and a podcaster. Yep, you are. <laughs> so I'm actually going to share some of this, a, a story or two from my book today. So I guess that's oh, kind of where exciting. we're at. Very cool. And you left out the most important part. What? Scott is a professional lip syncer. Oh, especially <laughs> especially to the greatest showman. Yeah. yeah. There was a time when that came out, Scott and I were both obsessed with it. We loved it. And he in particular got he well, you tell them. Tell you know what I'm you know where I'm going well, with this. So you tell so, them. So yeah. So in the show, I found out that um the one lady lip syncs never enough. She doesn't mm -hmm. actually really sing it in the movie. And so I kind of became obsessed with, I'm like, if she can lip sync it, I can lip sync it too. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm this 40 something adult mm -hmm. jamming out to never enough and trying to lip sync it. But then I actually <laughs> learned how to sing it. I would try to match it perfectly with, with the song anyway. Just, yeah. Then, then Alicia made me sing it in front of my ward. It so. was wonderful. <laughs> <laughs> it was the best thing that I've ever experienced. I just loved it. <laughs> yeah, it was fun. Oh, awesome. All right. Well, that was super fun. That made me smile. My cheeks hurt right now already. So good, good stuff. All right, Scott, take it away. Where are we starting with your story today? Whew. All right. Well, <clears throat> I think I'll start back when I was a kid. Um, you know, I grew up in the church and... Uh, you know, I, I always kind of knew that I wanted to go serve a mission and I had that always in the back of my head that I was going to do that. Um, but up until the, up until the time I actually went on my mission, you know, I, I tried to read the book of Mormon several times, but I never could get past second Nephi where it gets into the Isaiah <laughs> part. Mm -hmm. So I knew that first part of the book of Mormon really good, but I, you know, and I, I'd heard the stories in primary and stuff like I knew what was in there, but I never actually read past second Nephi. And I put my papers in, got my call to go to South Africa. And I'm like, crap, I need to read the book of Mormon before <laughs> I actually go on my mission. So uh, I started reading it and I got into the MTC and I wasn't finished yet. And so I'm, but I was right at the end. So I, I got done reading it in the MTC and I had, I was waiting to pray and, uh, you know, to get my confirmation that the church was true, like Moroni's promise in the back. So, right. uh, I remember talking to one of my teachers in the MTC and I'm, I'm like, you know what? I, I haven't, act, I confided into this teacher. I'm like, I've never actually prayed to know that the, you know, that the church is true. Right. And here I'm ready to go on the other side of the world uh, for two years. And, and uh, I mean, I, I believed it was true, but I never actually prayed and, you know, taken that challenge. And so the teacher's like, okay, well you need to, you know, so we went over the promise and, you know, we talked about praying with real intent and, you know, um, so I went that night and I prayed and I prayed and I prayed and nothing. I didn't get anything. And so <laughs> I went back the next day and I talked to the teacher and told, you know, I told her what happened and, and she was like, okay, do it again. And, <laughs> and she, she uh, talked about real intent as if you were underwater you know, and like, what do you want most out of, out of anything when you're underwater? You you want to take a breath. And right. so you have that, you know, more than anything you want to breathe. And, and she's like, you got to feel that same thing. You got to have that same desire about the mm -hmm. truth, the truthfulness of the gospel. And so that night, everyone else in the room went to sleep and I got down on my knees and I prayed. Probably I was praying 
seemed like forever, but it's probably more like an hour or so. But wow. anyway, I was just pleading with God, just please let me know that this is true, you know, and I just had, so after I'd done this for about an hour, I was just sitting there, my eyes closed and this scripture comes into my mind and it was, it was second. I saw it very clearly. It just said second Nephi thirty one fifteen, And I'm like, I don't, I have no idea what that scripture means. I don't know what it says. I don't know why it's coming into my head, but okay, I'll look it up. So I got up from my prayer. I went over to my little desk and I opened the scriptures and I just was, I sat there in shock and the scripture says, um, and I heard a voice from the father saying, Yea, the words of my beloved are true and faithful. He that endureth to the end, the same shall be saved. And oh I just goodness. felt the spirit go from the, all through me from the top to the bottom. And I just started crying. Wow. And yeah, I knew it was true. <laughs> and, oh my goodness. And so I went on my mission. And that was, yeah, that was how I, I knew that the church was true. Wow. And I know it's different for everyone, right? But mm -hmm. that's like that's what I guess what I needed to to know that uh, that it was true for me. <clears throat> right. So that was kind of the beginning of your like like your personal conversion. Like your real like hey, I'm in it for me. I'm not just doing this cuz that's what my family does or right. what it's expected of me. It's like you really, you know, that was kind of like your first little or big, I guess it'd be kind of big. It was England, big. Right? Yeah, it was yeah, big. Yeah, for sure. Awesome. So how did that, how did that help you on your mission? Like, did it, I don't know, did it make it easier, less scary, more, were you more confident in there? Like, how did, how did that go with you? I mean, it gave me a lot of conviction, right? I mean, that was mm -hmm. a, that was a really spiritual experience for me. And so it helped me a lot. I mean, when things were hard, I could, I could go back to that experience and right. it's kind of like an anchor, you know, to my testimony at the time. Yeah. And yeah, so I wrote it all down in my journal and I, I read it several times while I was out, right. Just to remember. Right. Yeah. That's awesome. So you had a successful mission, mm -hmm. right? Obviously, and you come home and life starts um, how do you feel your conversion? Like, did you feel like it continued to strengthen? Do you think it kind of plateaued? Like <clears throat> what happened when you got home? So I got home and, you know, I, I was still active in the church, but you know, life happens and, uh, you know, I started going to school, I got married, uh, and I, I still went to church every Sunday, but it kind of became just that's what you do. That's the routine. And, mm -hmm. you know, I wasn't, I wasn't like being super active in the gospel. I wasn't engaging like I should. And I got the weird thing happened. I started to get this fear of doing home teaching. And <laughs> really? <laughs> like, yeah, almost like a phobia. Yeah. That's it, was, so funny. it was super weird. And I, I got, <laughs> for some reason I had this thing in my head that I was bothering people and they didn't want, to, you know, like, gotcha. So I, I, I got in my head and then I, it was really hard for me to do my home teaching. I, I didn't do my, you know, my home teaching for several years. Mm -hmm. Um, and that was just this weird thing I had in my head that I, I had to get over and eventually I did. Um, and part of that was from an experience that I, another experience that I had that I actually talk about in the book. Um, so when my kids, a couple of my kids were little, well, they were the only kids I had at the time. <laughs> uh, we were going to Canada to go visit some family and our van broke down in just outside of Butte, Montana, which is an old mining town in the middle of nowhere. <laughs> Right. And <clears throat> so, so the van broke down. Um, 
Darla, my wife, her sister came and picked her up and the kids. And uh, we were able to find a shop that could get us a new transmission. But it was going to take five days. And so I hung out in Butte, Montana by myself and just kind of wandered around for five days <laughs> thinking about life. I had nothing else to do. <laughs> and um, so I did that. And I just, it was actually a really cool time because, uh, you know, you don't really have many opportunities like that just to be by yourself and have nothing to do for five days. Right. Right. And right. so I just, I thought about life and, and just where I was at in life and just reflected on things like I, my business, which was struggling at the time. Um, my relationship with, with my wife, which was, wasn't great. Um, and I was, I was overweight. Um, I was unhealthy. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I was, I was eating Tums like they were going out of style. I just, <laughs> there was just a lot of things that weren't, weren't really going super great. <laughs> and right. I just felt like my life was, I was supposed to do more, but I didn't really know how to get out of that rut. Yeah. And so Sunday came around and I went to church and then I came back to, to the hotel room and I was just sitting there. I hadn't turned on the TV the whole time I was in Butte. Wow. Not once. Wow. And so I was just sitting there <clears throat> and I decided that I was going to say a prayer. So I got down on my knees and I just started to pray, you know. And as I was praying, I had this experience where I started to see... Um, it's almost like a movie of my life. Mm -hmm. And it started when I was young and I started seeing these experiences that had happened to me. And as these experiences, as like, as I was watching my life, basically this movie of my life, I, I was <clears throat> aware that I was aware that God was there. Mm -hmm. He was, he was with me. And I could, I could feel him in those moments as I was going through these experiences in my life. Wow. And, and a lot of the experiences were, there were other people in, you know, it was experiences with others, with um, just people that had come into my life and out of my life, you know? Yeah. And I could just feel that God was there with me and with them and through them, God was with you know what I mean? Like yeah. it was just this really cool experience and it lasted and had to have been over a half an hour. And I was just having these, this watching this movie of my life unfold. And, <laughs> and when that prayer was over, I knew that God <clears throat> was there for me and that he had been watching over me my whole life. Wow. And um, in Mosiah chapter four, I think it is, uh, it might be four, four or five, but, um, there's a part where King Benjamin finishes teaching his people and they, they talk about this mighty change of heart. Mm -hmm. And I felt, I felt that for myself, this, this experience, I felt like my heart had changed and that's the only way that I can explain it. It, it felt like I had this mighty change of heart. Mm -hmm. And I just had this incredible desire to do nothing else than just show up for God for the rest of my life. And so I made him, I, I made him a promise right there in that hotel room in Butte, Montana, that <laughs> I was going to show up no matter what. And that kind of became my my personal motto, I guess, from that point on, is that I was going to show up no matter what for God. And so then I my van got fixed and I, I went back home and I started to show up. <laughs> 
So did you tell did you tell Darla? Did you tell your wife about what had happened and everything, or did you kind of keep that to yourself for a little while? No, I told her. <clears throat> yeah. Um. Yeah, but I mean, at the t- at the time, she, she's like, "Okay, honey, <laughs> you know, like whatever." <laughs> Like, okay, that's nice. <laughs> we'll see what happens. Yeah. <laughs> awesome. So did she start seeing changes in you though? Like like did that help with your relationship and you know what I mean? Like, did you start seeing blessings from that in other areas in your life? Yeah, so when I got home, I decided that um I was going to start making changes, right, in my life. And mm-hmm. so um, one of the first things I did was I, I decided I was going to go to the gym and mm-hmm. get healthy. And so I, I started by myself. I just, one day I'm like, okay, I'm going to go to start going to the gym on this day. And I didn't know what to do. I had never been bef- to the gym before, <laughs> but I decided just to go get on the elliptical and start walking. And then I then I started listening to Tony Robbins as I was walking, yeah. and he started talking about goals. <clears throat> and so then I I I wrote down some goals, and um, some of those were spiritual goals, some of them were um, financial goals, some of them were you know physical goals, and um, within. Within a, a few years, I had accomplished all of the goals that I had set out to do. So that was pretty cool. Wow. That is cool. I lost 45 pounds um, in three months. Oh, my gosh. And one, one of the cool things is so um, what Tony Robbins talks about going on power walks. And... Mm-hmm. So I started doing that after every time I, I after I'd work out, I'd go for a walk. And when I was on those walks, I would pray. And I remember um praying about home teaching and about about you know my fear, that fear I had. <laughs> and as I was as I was on a walk one day, I remember thinking that um if that I could replace fear with love I had this thought, you know, like you don't need to be afraid. You just need to, to love the people that you serve. And so wow. I decided that I was going to go home teaching and I was just going to have a feeling of love for whoever it was that I was going to home teach. Cause at that point I hadn't gone for so long. I didn't even know who my home teach, you know, who, <laughs> who I was home teaching. Right. And so at the time, everyone that I home taught was was less active. Mm-hmm. And I remember going in and just with that feeling of love. And then I made a commitment because I told God I would show up no matter what. So I'm, I made a commitment that I was going to go home teaching every single month, no matter what. Wow. And so I started doing that. And the cool thing that happened was I started get, building relationships with these families and um, two of the families came back to church and they became Aww. active. That's amazing. Yeah. And then another wow. one was a, was a, a single lady. She was older and, um, she uh her name was Lucille and she was feisty she was <laughs> <laughs> and she she smoked uh a lot mm-hmm. but she, you know and when i first the first time i talked to her she i talked to her on the phone i just introduced myself who i was and asked you know if i could come and visit her sometime and at first she she said no but she said I, I could talk to her on the phone. So I called oh. her back uh, the next month and we had another conversation. And then after, you know, three months or so, she finally said I could come and visit her. Hmm. And so, you know, uh, we became friends. And then one day I brought my kids and I brought Darla 
And before you knew it, she was like a second grandma. Aw, that's awesome. So then my kids would always come with me. My family would uh, sometimes they would go without me. Oh, that's awesome. Yeah. And she would give them gifts and my kids would give her gifts and, and cards Aww. and things like that. Well, eventually she never stopped smoking and she never came to church. But, you know, that almost became like a non-issue. Like that was, yeah. you know, she wouldn't do it when we were there. Right. And, but it was, it that was like, it didn't matter. Right. Um, and before she died, she asked me if I would speak at her shindig. <laughs> she called it her shindig. She called it her funeral a shindig. <laughs> and I told her I would, and I did. Yeah. Right. When she eventually uh... passed away, I spoke at her funeral. <clears throat> Um, but two of the other families, yeah, they became active and they're still active and they ended up both ended up going through the temple and yeah. So Aww. that was cool. Like, that's and I'm not saying that was, I'm not saying that was me. I'm just saying, you know, I, I was a part of that, but if right. that, I wouldn't have been a part of it if I wouldn't have made that commitment. Right. And to just actually show replaced, up. Yeah, exactly. Replaced my fear with love. Right. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, I love, I love how, you know, you got to see both sides of the coins, like how, like, yeah, you loved, you loved the two families and they were able to come back to the church and, and to go through the temple and stuff like that. But you also just got to love Lucille, who I'm sure that those relationships that you guys, that you and your family built with her, they probably greatly impacted her life and made her feel you know, heavenly father's love. And, and you, I mean, we don't know, right? Like we have no idea what was going on in her heart. And, um, I know we kind of talked a little bit about just my, even my own family, right? Like my dad, it took him uh, 50 years or something like Mm -hmm. that before he quit smoking. You know what I mean? And, and there were a lot of times where my mom would be completely drunk and she would just be bearing her testimony drunk. You know what I mean? So even if they have these addictions or these things that kind of make them feel uncomfortable physically going to church, you, you guys were able to bring some of that to her, you know? So I, I love that. I love that. Like showing up had so many great benefits to not just you and your family, but to those that you showed up to help, you know, to be there for. So, and apparently Heavenly Father thought that you did a really good job ministering because what happened? <laughs> yeah. So because I made that commitment to do my own teaching 100%, right? Mm-hmm. Um, that got noticed by the bishop and he made me the elders quorum president. So uh, I tried to adopt that same idea, that same, you know, showing up and... Uh, the same principles to the elders quorum. So I, I continually challenged the elders quorum to get a hundred percent home teaching. Mm-hmm. And, you know, we, we were able to do it several times. Wow. Um, yeah. That's so that awesome. was pretty cool. Um, and what we would do is, you know, we would, we would encourage everyone to go do their home teaching and then we would follow up with them on a regular basis to see if they'd done it. Mm -hmm. And for those that hadn't done it by the end of the month, we would try to either go with them. And if there's, if that couldn't happen, then we would go for them because what we realized is it's, it's more important that the people get visited. And if, if their home teacher can do it, that's the best option. But if Mm -hmm. not, it's better that somebody goes right. Oh, I love that. So, yeah, so we would we did that several months, um, and that was really cool. It was it was a lot of work, but it was worth it. Mm-hmm. So I went from <laughs> I went from being afraid to talking to anyone about home teaching, right, <laughs> to actually going like to so many houses, like I can't even count them. <laughs> I I bought so many things of cookies. It's not even funny. <laughs> so it was That's I was funny. like the guy on. <clears throat> um, one of the, the was it the R the 
RM where he's where he's pushing cookies through the oh yeah through the little mailbox <laughs> thing. Yeah. Yeah. Oh my gosh, that's so funny. Anyway, it was fun, <clears throat> and that actually brought our elders quorum closer together too, right? Because we were working mm-hmm. for a common goal, and and um, yeah, it was it was a good time. It was it was it was a great time, and then. So I was the elders quorum president for a few years, and then they made me the bishop in my ward, <laughs> which was a shocker. I I did not see it coming. Um, but really, uh, so you didn't have bishop. any inkling or nothing? No, it was just it, oh, that's completely funny. completely <laughs> out of the blue. I I thought I was doing good as an elders quorum president, you know, but I didn't. Like, yeah. yeah, completely blindsided me. So how was that? Like receiving that that invitation to be a bishop was that terrifying or were you kind of like okay like i'll figure this out or you know how how did that make you feel i mean it was it was definitely a shocker i remember you know going into the state president's office and he asked me and you know i i knew already whatever he was going to say i was going to say yes because i already committed to god to show up no matter what right so yep I said yes, um, and then I just had to have that faith that God was going to help me figure out what to do from there. Uh, but my stake president was, it was absolutely amazing. I love him to death, and he always had my back. And I had uh, one of the things I learned as the elders quorum president was the importance of having really good counselors. Mm, yeah, <clears throat> and so I. I applied that when I was a bishop. I had some incredible counselors that I just knew always had my back. And that made all the yeah. difference in the world. Yeah. Because I really felt like we were one, you know, mm-hmm. and that, and that gave me so much comfort and, um, you know, through all the challenges and, and trials that you go through as a bishop. Um, I knew, I knew I always had people I could rely on uh, that could yeah. help me carry that burden. So that, that really helped me a lot. Do you feel that, that your commitment to showing up for the Lord kind of helps you to be put in a position where you, um, you end up being surrounded by more people with that same kind of goal and that same kind of, kind of dedication? Or do you feel like Heavenly Father's kind of puts you more in a like, hey, you're a worker bee, so I'm going to stick you over here <laughs> to inspire other people to become worker bees. Like, how do you, you know, I guess, how, how do you think that Heavenly Father kind of uses you? Huh. Uh, I think I've seen both sides of that. Um, there's mm-hmm. definitely been a lot of times where, you know, I felt God just put me in certain places or, or, um, different gave me different opportunities to to help certain people by on my own um but then there's been other times where i've been surrounded by just incredible people that we and we did a lot we could do a lot more together yeah um so there's both uh but i feel like god can trust me to do things on my own yeah and and i and i feel confident doing that too right um, so that's awesome. I love, I feel like it was, uh, in one of the most recent conferences that we've had and I was just talking to, <clears throat> who was I talking to about that? Someone I was talking to someone, maybe John, I don't know, maybe my husband. Anyway, I was talking to someone about, <laughs> um, this, this thing that I heard, I, I believe it was in one of the recent conferences that said, um, you know, heavenly father trusts us to make a decision and then to make that decision Right. And there's a lot of times I think where I know one of my problems that I struggled with in the past was trying to figure out like, okay, what's going to be the best decision? You know, like, what do I have to do? So I would sit there in limbo doing nothing, just weighing out all of the options over and over again. And, and I could never actually get the, the gumption to start doing anything good. So I did nothing good because I was Mm -hmm. just weighing out all the options, you know? And so I loved that, that quote, it, that's kind of become like my, my motto lately is like, just make a decision and then make that decision be right. You know what I mean? Right. Like, of course, if we're doing the things that Heavenly Father wants us to do, if we're striving to, 
you know, keep communication open with him and we're reading our scriptures or we're doing our callings or whatever it is, you know, I think sometimes we get so hung up on like the what we have to do that we forget we actually have to do something. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like we can't just keep sitting around. So um I remember uh right before I moved out of the ward, you gave a talk about this, about showing up. And I think we mentioned in one of the other podcasts how that was one of my most favorite talks I've ever heard. Like hands down. It I loved it so much. It like I wanted to I wanted to stand up in sacrament and be like, yeah, yeah, you know, like I wanted to like cheer for you because I was like, yes, that's what we need to do. We need to show up. And I don't know. It just it was so inspiring to me that it was something that ended up kind of just lingering in the back of my head at all times. Like, just show up, just do it. Like say yes to everything. And then if you have to readjust a little bit later on, that's okay, you know? So um that was my big, huge tangent. I don't know where I was going with that. <laughs> well, let me honest. let me share one of my favorite quotes. I just pulled it up on my phone. Okay. Because uh, you just mentioned that sometimes you didn't know what you should do. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> I find that, well, even this f- was for me, <clears throat> when I f- was first put in as the bishop, I needed help figuring out who my counselors were, right? And so mm-hmm. I prayed and I asked God to help me. And I knew like I, I got an answer that I, who they should be, which was cool. Um, but after that, there were many, many times where I would pray and I wouldn't get anything. Right. Right. And so I was, I'm like, is this normal? Like, should I be <laughs> getting like answers for everything? Cause I'm the Bishop. Right. And so I found some really cool, um, quotes that really helped me a lot. And I think this could be valuable for anyone that's listening. So Dallin H. Oaks said, we, um, let's see. Oh, sorry. Richard G. Scott. Uh, he says, God is our perfect father. He loves us beyond our capacity to understand. He knows what is best for us. He sees the end from the beginning. He wants us to act to gain needed experience. When he answers yes, it's to give us confidence. When he answers no, it's to prevent error. When he withholds an answer, it is to have us grow through faith in him, obedience to his commandments, and a willingness to act on truth. We are expected to assume accountability by acting on a decision that is consistent with his teachings and without prior confirmation. We are not to sit passively waiting or to murmur because the Lord has not spoken. We are to act. I love that. That helped me a ton because um, God trusted me that I could make good decisions. I didn't have to ask him for everything. Exactly. In fact, he expected me not to because he knew that he could trust me to make good choices. And if it was something Mm -hmm. that he, he, he distinctly wanted me to do, he would tell me. Right. Right. And if it was, if, If it wasn't super important and I needed to learn a lesson, you know, like I would learn the lesson through maybe making the wrong choice the first time or, right. Right. Like, so I learned to trust my instincts and my faith, knowing that God would be there to catch me if, if he needed to, but he trusted me to make good decisions. And And then I also had my counselors that I could help that could help me too. Mm-hmm. Right? If if I needed right. additional guidance, you know, or something like that. So that helped me a lot. Um God trusts us a lot more than we think. And yeah. we just have to have that faith that he's going to have our back when when he needs to, but otherwise we can just move forward. Yeah. You know, my niece, I was having a conversation with her last night. And, um, and we were kind of talking about like, do you think that every single thing happens for a reason? And I, I I know that it's a really popular, like a really popular, um, belief that everything happens for a reason. And it is catchy to say, right. But when I, Mm -hmm. when I sit and I dissect it, I'm like, I don't know if everything happens for a reason, but I know there, there can be a purpose and, and a silver lining found in everything that happens. So sometimes I think that the reason is just that we're stupid. Like we just make dumb choices because we're being selfish or we're immature or we don't have life experience. And maybe we just, you know, like, I don't, 
I don't think that the mistakes that I've made or even the intentional bad decisions that I've made, right? Like, cause sometimes it's not a mistake. Sometimes I go in fully knowing I'm going to screw this up. <laughs> mm-hmm. Right. But I don't think that that's like heavenly father's like, I don't think he's making me make a bad decision in order to have some purpose come to fruition. I think that sometimes he's like, all right, you want to do that. I guess it's going to take a little longer to get you to this destination, but you know, I can work with that. It's okay. I can, he can work with our, you know, our stubbornness and our stupidity and, and things like that. And so I, I was just telling her, I was like, I don't think that everything happens for a reason, but I do think that everything can have a purpose in it. Like we can make a reason for anything and we can find a way to get back on the path that our heavenly father wants us to be on. And it's like really more so up to us. How quickly do we want to reach that destination? And the destination I don't really believe is like a place. I think it's a, a a point of personal growth and development. I think it's like a who, right? Like Mm -hmm. our destination is always going to be who the Lord needs us to be, you know, like the most, upstanding uh, version of ourselves that is imaginable. I think that's always the destination, right? And so when we do things like you were talking about in your story, when we show up for the Lord and we keep trying and we keep making those decisions and we just keep moving forward in action, it'll help get us to who we're meant to be with maybe a few less bumps and bruises than what we would have just kind of sitting and waiting or, you know, just not being all in for the Lord, you know? Yeah. It's going to be less of a bumpy ride probably Yeah, (laughs) in general, right? Mm -hmm. You're going to, you're going to, God's going to give you a few shortcuts or, you know, a few easy trails along the way. Yeah, And even Um, if it's not like easy, he'll still, he'll still make it like, okay for us. It's kind of like, we've had so with this move to alaska <laughs> this week i think i've gotten like maybe a few hours of sleep total every night we have uh jack is oh poor kid he's dealing with kidney stones right now so we've been in the er you know for six hours last night um dealing with it and back and forth the doctor's appointments and then just like one person's getting sick and i've got a niece and nephew that are leaving and they need to go to salt lake which is a almost four hour drive to get to salt lake to get them on a plane and it's it, and then we find out that our schedule for alaska is like mixed up and it's going to cost all this extra money to do this it's just like one thing after another right but for some reason i still feel pretty happy and i still feel at peace and i'm like that's okay it's okay if everything if everything falls apart right now because i know that we've already prayed about this i know that heavenly father has a has something you know for us there in alaska and so even if it looks messy right now, like I can handle the mess, you know, might yeah. still have to go through it, might still get a little dirty, a little bumpy, but I can handle it. And it's not, it's not going to kill me. You know what I mean? Like, it's not going to be the end of the world because on the other side of it, it's going to be something beautiful and new and exciting and that's okay. <laughs> so. Right. Yeah. You just, you got to move forward in faith mm-hmm. every day. It it never ends, right? That's why it's enduring to the end. Yeah. Because it's, you just got to keep going every day. Um, But eventually you get there. And it's not always going to be easy. There's always going to be challenges and things. But but when you have faith in God and you have your testimony, it makes things a little bit easier. Yeah. When when the hard times come. How do you keep, uh, keep up the energy? to continually show up. I mean, you're not Bishop right now, you, but you still have things on your plate. You still have a calling and you still have your family and you still have your business. And, you know, how do you, how do you stay committed to showing up for the Lord? <laughs> um, <laughs> well, I still go on walks. I still nice. exercise. Um, so those walks help me a lot because that's, I love, uh, walking and praying. That's something that I, mm-hmm. I've just learned to love over the years now. It's been um, probably 15 years since that first experience wow. in Butte. Um, so, you know, I've, I've really enjoyed walking and praying and I still do it. And that really allows me to 
because I'm alert, um, it gives me the ability to really look at my life from a 10,000 foot view on a regular basis. And so I can, I get that opportunity to just kind of see, you know, where areas that I could potentially improve, um, or opportunities to help other people or yeah, you know, just, just things like that. Um, so that, that helps me to stay on, on that path. Mm -hmm. Um, writing my book helped me a lot. Um, a lot of introspection, a lot of research. I think if anybody it, that writing that book probably helped, helped me the most, <laughs> right. To keep my yeah. testimony strong. Um, I'm the gospel doctrine teacher. So that helps, you know, there's, so there's all those, all these kind of things that, that are put into my life to help me stay on the path and stay focused, but it's not overwhelming. Mm -hmm. uh, and yeah, I just keep going. Well, just a little thing. I don't know. Huh? Yeah. Little habits and yeah, that's awesome. Well, I love that. I, I like the, what you said about having like this 10,000 foot view, you know, like to be able to like have this perspective to look down on your life and everything like that. I think that that more than anything, just having that perspective of like, one, that this life, this life truly is a time for us to prepare to meet God, right? Like it's, it's not about chasing the dollar. It's not about um, having, you know, a million different adventures. It's not about um, just finding that person that's going to be your forever person, even, you know what I mean? Like it's truly about doing what needs to be done in order for you to feel as prepared as possible to meet our heavenly father again, you know, to be able to see him and to hopefully hear him, you know, say, well done, thou good and mm -hmm. faithful servant, you know? And so I, I, I love that you talk about that because perspective, I don't know, for me, I just, I've, maybe it's just getting older, you know, like I'm almost 40 as well. I, I, I just feel like, um, I try so much harder nowadays to see a much broader perspective in every single situation that I'm in, you know, even things like, I don't know, it's little things like, okay, we're sitting, <laughs> we go to the ER last night and the, hospital here unfortunately has a, has a bad rep there's a lot of people who like to complain about how long it takes to do things and whatever else right my bishop is ceo of the hospital and so when i found that out i was like he's like such an amazing guy he's such a great person and he loves people and and he would never not give his all for for his work because i i like i just know that because i see him give his all being a bishop right and so um we're sitting there last night and i thought Oh, like, I know it's going to be a little bit of a wait. We were told it would be two to three hours and that there were five people in front of us. And I was like, okay, no big deal. Well, as we get up to the two hours and then the three hours and then the four hours and we're still not being called back, I'm like, oh, like I'm getting, I'm getting really tired and really hungry. And these hospital chairs are very uncomfortable. And, you know, my poor kid is sitting here and he's in pain and I, there's nothing I can do. And, mm -hmm. and so I, I had asked and, you know, they just it turns out there was one person on shift. Right. And, um, she, the way that the emergency room works is of course they take the priority, not the, Hey, I got here first. So it's, mm -hmm. it's going to be priority first. Right. So a lot of people kept bumping ahead of us, bumping ahead of us, you know? And, uh, and as Jack and I are sitting there, we hear this person off to the side and and they are just livid. You know, I've been here for, you know, three hours and I'm waiting already and nobody did it. They're just complaining and they're yelling and they're frustrated. And I mean, I get it. I've been there. You know what I mean? Like I'm literally there, <laughs> you know? And, um, and I just had this perspective moment, right. Where like, I kind of got to see a little bit more than what I normally would have saw. And, and my thought was, you know, if I have to sit here for a few hours and be uncomfortable, it's the least that I can do to show gratitude for all of the people in the hospital who have literally spent thousands of dollars and thousands of hours to learn the profession, to accept a job, to show up, right. To mm -hmm. be there 
and to be able to provide care for my son in the midst of this, you know, pseudo emergency that we're having. So if I have to wait for a few hours so that they can take care of people, you know, like that's the least that I can do is, is to do so graciously and to not complain about it and to just, you know, be there. Well, the funny thing is there were two people that showed up in the emergency room who were both in our ward and they're not active, you know? And so I got a mm-hmm. chance to sit there and to, one was a mom with, with two young kids. She had a little baby and a, a very energetic seven-year-old boy. Um, and I got to sit and talk with her for a while and comfort her. And then there, there was another woman who was there with her adult daughter. And, um, you know, like I just, it was kind of like, okay, like, if I'm going to be here, I can still show up for the Lord. Like I can still, yeah. you know, it's a bad situation and it stinks having to wait and it's super boring and my butt hurts, <laughs> you know, and I've eaten like four candy bars out of the vending machine already, <laughs> you know, but maybe it makes it a little easier for the mom that's there with her, her, you know, two kiddos. And maybe it makes it a little easier for this other person. And so I just, I tried to make it a point to thank the nurses and to not complain about the time. And, and when we went to leave. I know I just got really long winded again. Sorry. When we went to leave, uh, one of the nurses that had taken us back, um, she literally thanked me profusely. She's like, you are the first patient that we've had all day that has not yelled at us or complained about how long they've had to wait. And she's like, seriously, thank you. And it just, it just meant something to me. I was like, you know, and then I found out that the lady that was doing the CT scans on my son she came into work and she's sick because there was nobody else and she had not had a break all night long. So the six hours that I'm sitting there eating candy bars on the vending machine, she is up and running and she's sick. You know, she's got her mask on. You can tell that she just doesn't feel good at all. She's trying to keep her distance, but at the same time be helpful. And I was like, oh, like my heart just went out to her, you know? So it's, it's like that perspective that you talked about is so important in life. And I think it really does help you to, to be like, you know, there's a lot more that I can do. My life is not as busy as I think it is, even though it is, <laughs> it is mm-hmm. really busy. Right. Or even if it is super busy, there's still a lot you can do in your busyness to still show up for the Lord. You know, your attitude can be a great, huge, uh, factor in showing up, right. Show up happy, right. show up loving. Like you said, like show up with love, just love them. That's all you have to do. You know, I don't well, know. If I just, you were I think if you were angry, if you were angry when those uh, uh you know those less active members came in, maybe you could have missed you would would have missed that opportunity to maybe yeah. share a little bit of light into their lives, yeah, or even true. share light with the with the nurses and things. You know, you're right. you having that positive attitude makes a difference. Yeah, you know? it does, and I feel like other people. Sometimes they just need a little dose of perspective and and they don't really know how to see it on their own. So when, when you can share that perspective with others, um, whether it's on, on a gospel level or just on a, just a level of like, Hey, let's just show some love. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, I think that there's a, there's a lot of things that heavenly father can do with that. You know, he can build relationships and he can help people calm down and I don't know, maybe help them to be a little bit more grateful for what they do have. So anyway, well, Scott, do you have any final thoughts for our listeners today? (laughs) You know, I, I feel like God has some amazing things that he can do in each of our lives. Uh, mm-hmm. bigger things than than we picture for ourselves but in order for him to do that we really have to be willing to show up for him um, and I've tried to teach my kids that ever since I had that realization I've taught my kids you know we just we have to show up for God no matter what mm-hmm. and you know if we we each have that opportunity every day um, to show up and if we take that opportunity and we look for those opportunities to show up, then it'll bless our lives. It'll bless our family's lives. It'll bless the lives of those around us. And, yeah. and that's a huge blessing in, you know, so I guess my, my 
my message would be, you know, do everything you can to show up for God, no matter what, and you'll see some incredible, incredible things happen in your life. I agree. Well, thank you so much. I'm see, this is such a good story. I don't know why you're such a chicken and you didn't want to share it earlier. No. <laughs> Just joking. <laughs> no, I think this is a really this is a really great time. You know, guys, we are coming into well, we are we're officially in December. We this is the season to light the world. This is something that the church um has really, really tried to do and tried to focus on every December for the last few years. Um and I, I think that, you know, Scott, you sharing your story is just one of those ways that we can light the world, you know, sharing our personal conversion story, sharing our, our perspective, sharing the lessons that we've learned and the testimonies that we have, no matter how big or small they are, no matter where we're at on our conversion story, these are amazing ways, guys, that we can light the world. And so I just want to encourage you, you know, if, um, if you got something out of today's show, you know, be sure to to share it on your Facebook or your Instagram or wherever you're going to share it. Share it with friends or family. Maybe sit down with some family members, you know, have them over for have friends over for dinner and stuff like that. And and maybe just listen to a show. Just talk a little bit about where your conversion um, has happened throughout your life. You know, don't don't keep it inside and hoard it for yourself. Make sure that you let other people know just how much heavenly father has shown up for you. Right. Um, we would love, love, love to hear more stories. So if you guys have a story, um, please be sure to head over to latterdaylights.com and you can fill out a little form at the bottom of the, the main page there or whatever. And you can let us know, you know, what you have to share to the world. We would be happy to, to use this platform for that. So, yeah. Yeah, this this whole show exists to help you share your story with the world and mm -hmm. to, so use it. Take this opportunity. That's <laughs> what we're here for. We're we're here to help you to share your story. That's the whole reason we're here. Um so yeah. let's let's make it count. Let's make this time count. Let's make a difference together. Um you don't need to be afraid. You don't need to be scared. We don't mm -hmm. bite. Um, well, and, no, I'm just <laughs> um, you know, and it's actually really easy. We may, you know, you just, you just start talking and, and then it just comes out and, mm -hmm. you know, if you've watched any of our episodes, we just ask questions and, and make some comments along the way. And, you know, together we create something cool that, that can then live on, uh, you know, for other people to, to listen to and be inspired by. So, yeah, go to latterdaylights.com, fill out that little contact us form and let's talk. Let's let's get you on the show. Absolutely. All right. Well, thank you guys for tuning in. Thank you again, Scott, for finally sharing your story. <laughs> it was really, really great. And I have uh, other stories to share in the future. <laughs> this is just the yes. first one. I love it. I love it. I think this is pretty much what you guys are going to get. Whenever we have a little bit of a lull, you know, if we have some scheduling conflicts, you're just going to get a bunch of Scott and Alicia stories, I guess. So if you don't want to hear all of our stories, you better call us, <laughs> call us, text us, email us, send us some ESP waves, <laughs> something like that. So, all right, guys. Well, I hope that you guys are all making the most out of this first part of December. We would love to hear too. If you guys want to uh, drop us a line, just let us know what you're doing to light the world. I think that that would be so fun. Don't you think, Scott? Yeah. Totally. It'd be really, really cool. Maybe we can even do something. Maybe we can share a little something, you know, over the next few weeks and stuff of like people, you know, different ways that they've light, uh, lighted, lit up the world. Lit up the world. Yes, that's how you would say it. <laughs> All right, guys. Well, you have a wonderful week and we will talk to you guys next time. See you later. Take care. <laughs>